Hello, everyone out there in Geek Vibes Nation. This is your friend and pal, Dane Alps, with another enticing episode of Wrestling Geeks Alliance. Wrestling Geeks Alliance. Uh, sorry about that. It's a little bit early, even though it's noon. Uh, a show in which we do every Thursday at 7 p.m. EST, and also on Saturdays at noon, if you couldn't tell from all this. Um, I'm, of course, with my amazing co-host, Christopher Brother Ray Patton. How you doing, sir? Doing wonderful, man. Uh, a little early for me, too. I had to go up, go, get up and go to PetSmart this morning, so that was an adventure in itself. But uh, other than that, man, I'm doing great. Going to play some guitar later, jam out with some friends, and uh, drink some beer. You know, well, friends, I mean one friend, you know, because social distancing, et cetera. <laughs> but uh, how, how's your weekend going, bud? You know, I can't complain. Uh, woke up a little while ago and, uh, you know, just... Decided, let's do a show, man. And we, and we have a fun show, I think, for everyone today. Um, we're going to go over SmackDown. There's a teeny bit of news to talk about. But we're going to practice um, our, our, our new Hall of Fame. And we don't know exactly what we have named this Hall of Fame. I had an idea. Um, just randomly came to me. I think we should call it the Observing Wrestlers Hall of Fame, Chris. Since that's what we do, right? <laughs> I I, uh, I kind of like the observing wrestlers Hall of Fame. Um, let's see if we can make Alvarez and and <laughs> Meltzer send us a fucking message on Twitter. I guess. <laughs> yeah, like a cease and desist or something. <laughs> yeah. No, that's 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 only Goldberg that does that to me. <laughs> oh God! What a what a wonderful person. Goldberg's not going to make the uh, Hall of Fame. I'll just give you guys that. Uh, but yeah, it'll be fun. We got twenty people that we we have. Chris came up with ten. I came up with ten, and we're going to basically uh, get it down uh, to to five people to join the first class today. So it's going to be a doozy. Maybe there should be some debating, some 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 aggressive tension. Probably not. It'll probably just me and Chris being like, "Yeah, man, you're right," you know. But we'll we'll figure it out. From there. <laughs> we're we're hoping for the audio version of blood and guts, but uh, more than likely it's going to be like, well, I mean, all of these guys deserve to be in there. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because like if we do five by five, it's like we're going to eventually have everyone in there anyways. That's part of our top twenty. I was thinking, and we don't have to do this necessarily. I don't know what we do for a fifth option, but once we do figure out the five, we obviously have that 15. We need to replenish that 20 maybe and just come up with five that we want to add to the next round, if you will. Yeah, and if if people out there listening uh, have any ideas or if you have submissions that you think deserve to be on these lists, maybe a glaring uh, glaring person we're missing since which I look at this list and I, I know of a few right now that people are going to freak out about not being on this initial list. But uh, yeah, you can shoot us those too and maybe we can build the pool that way. But uh, this is just going to be a fun interactive thing, hopefully for everyone listening out there and we get to talk about some great wrestlers and some great past matches. It's, uh, it's going to harken back to the old days when we kind of first started this thing. Absolutely. Um, all right, well, uh, let's, uh, since you said blood and guts, uh, we unfortunately have a statement from Tony Khan that came out this morning. I think Wrestling Inc. was the first one to cover it um, after the statement was made, and basically Tony um, let us know that the blood and guts, uh, I'll, I'll call it a semi-pay-per-view, because even though it's on a dynamite, it's kind of like the uh, the two-night um, bash the beach that they did, one of them being on the Jericho Cruise. Uh, so this is kind of what they're doing in between these bigger pay-per-views, which is very smart because, you know, if you're putting a semi-pay-per-view or whatever, something that gives, you know, a little bit of a 
difference from normal shows. It, people are going to tune in even more so on Wednesdays. So, so it makes a lot of sense. But the blood and guts, I don't know if it's so much the aspect of what I was referring to, you know, the fact that it would probably not be the most, you know, the smartest idea to have guys bleeding, which is usually a War Games match, which is very old school reminiscent of the Dusty era of WCW, which is what Cody goes for, you know, usually. It seems like that's kind of like needed. And not only that, without the live audience, the other big aspect of it, it just seems like it is a smart idea to hold off. Uh, Tony said that they're going to continue doing shows, though. So the, 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 the statement was, we plan to continue answering that call uh, with live weekly shows every Wednesday night on TNT. I'm assuming at the same Jacksonville Amphitheater that they were doing it at. But the time and circumstances aren't right for the card we have planned next week for Blood and Guts. That show will happen when the time is right. But what you can count on instead of this coming Wednesday night is a great live uh, episode of AEW Dynamite featuring Chris Jericho confronting Matt Hardy face-to-face, one-on-one, for the first time ever on AEW and a tremendous night of wrestling action in general. Chris, uh, the statement, uh, the concept of holding off on blood and guts, but the fact that we're still getting weekly programming from AEW. Well, I'm excited that we're still getting weekly programming because I think they've done a really good job based off that first show of kind of handling the situation. And, you know, financially, it probably makes sense for them to hold off on that match because you're going to sell tickets to it um, in theory. And it could be their first big show back when they decide, okay, now it's time to let people back in the arenas, etc. I think that's a smart move. I don't know how much it has to deal with the match itself, but I think, like you said, the, the audience aspect of it, you definitely want people in the building for this. I mean, it's well, you, like you said, it's not a pay per view per se, but it is definitely a huge match, huge night feel, kind of like a Raw special, like with like three sixteen day used to be, or when they bring the Rock back, it, it's supposed to be a big draw type deal. Or when NXT um, got invaded by WWE, it's something you should be promoting in the future and having a good build up too. And if AEW showed us anything, they should be able to continue to flesh these storylines out. There's no need to rush it, and having Matt Hardy back, I'm sure, will even help that further. Uh, with some of his creativity headed into this match. So <clears throat> I'm looking forward to seeing what they do, and I, I look forward to their weekly show. And to me, this statement makes sense from Tony Khan. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But um, hey, as long as we're getting weekly television, you know, unless they get told that they can't, I think that we should be happy for what we got. And, uh, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, I'm going to refer that to SmackDown. Um I have no idea if you feel the same way, um, but I'm a little bit more used to the setting um, after the last two shows. Uh, I, it's not pleasing, but it didn't come off as awkward and as weird as Raw and SmackDown did. It's, it wasn't obviously – I like the way that, a, that AEW is handling it. They seem to have had, uh, added a couple more people around there, like crew-wise and stuff like that. Um, you know, I still would put people in the audience if you can. I know it's a smaller place, and they're trying to do the same thing that everyone's saying to do with social distancing and whatnot. But, um, you know, I, I thought it was a, a pretty good show, a very interesting open. Not a lot of wrestling, uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll go down the card. Um, overall, what did you think about uh, SmackDown? Well, I mean, it didn't have Sammy Guevara singing Judas, so it was not as good as AEW. <laughs> <laughs> which has still been my favorite thing, I think, in wrestling <laughs> this past week. Um, you know, it was it was much better than last week's show. I'll give them that, and they gave us some decent matches. We didn't get a lot, um, but they did do a focus on, you know, bringing Rob Gronkowski in and building that storyline up for him being the host of Mania and continuing to try to build out their storylines for this big show that they have coming up, uh, man, what, two weeks from now? That's kind of crazy to think about that Mania is two weeks from now, but... Uh, yeah, overall, I like the show. Um, it kind of sucks to see some of these superstars coming back. Sorry, I just hit my mic. Uh, it kind of sucks to see some of these superstars coming back with, you know, no crowd, such as, you know, Paige, and this big Rob Gronkowski unveil, and, and before that, uh, Jeff Hardy. Um, Edge. Edge. So, you know, that part of it sucks, but... Stone Cold. It, Stone John Cold, Steven. yeah. <laughs> rocking a hard place. I mean, they got to do it because they're booking mania around those guys, some of those guys, I should say. And um, yeah, but overall, I thought it was a way better show than 
last week, and I, I liked that they didn't start it out with wrestlers just coming out talking for 10 minutes necessarily. The way they went about it this week was much better than, let's say, having Bailey and Sasha cut a promo against, uh, fuck, Alexa Bliss. Yeah, and I actually think that the way they handled the page thing with Bailey and um, uh, Sasha was um, was way better also, just handled. But, you know, Paige is such a uh, good person. It was weird. I didn't re- – I, I was like – I feel like this is just pre-recorded and she's giving them space and they're just kind of like going back and forth. But, you know, maybe she was live. I have no idea. The two questions I have for you, um, <laughs> one of them is is Mr. Gronkowski, uh, you know, him dancing on the way there. And I guess it really is they're going with him and Mojo kind of being somewhat of a unit. Um, and the fact that the match that they decided to choose to kind of fill up time I think it would made a lot more sense. Uh, you know, I get the the charm of having this attraction concept with giving out the pay per views, uh, big matches the last two times to try to get. You know, we were talking about that other viewers uh, that don't have a lot to watch that aren't maybe diehard fans like me and you. But now, you know, we said the Hall of Fame. It kind of makes sense to possibly, if you have room for it, maybe a Randy Orton Edge match in the future uh, from the past or an RKO. Um, or I can't remember the tag team, but um, uh, Rated RKO versus DX match or something like that uh, to flesh stuff out. I thought actually the choice of the match that they did was uh, smart. I don't know how I feel, though, about Michael Cole just doing it by himself. I think he did a good job because he was, you know, doing more that what I think I like from him, the play-by-play stuff. He had to concentrate, but, you know, you had three guys and you risked Jerry Lawler coming to to, uh, to Raw it just seems like if you're not going to do – if you don't have Corey um, for whatever reason, you know, um, I don't know. It just seems like you could have filled uh, someone else in there. How, how do you feel about maybe th- those three things? The match they chose from the past uh, with Bray Wyatt and John Cena. Uh, Gronkowski, you know, acting the way he does basically and getting hype. And then also Michael Cole uh, being solo on commentary. I, I liked that they did – show a match from the past and and tried to build the storyline up. It's not one of my favorite John Cena matches, but it does play into at least the WrestleMania um, feud. I thought Michael Cole was fine on commentary. Um, It's a little bit weird, him soloing it, but I think he showed that he could handle himself properly. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot to call, being that there was only really two matches, and then the main commentary would have been the whole team on that Cena-Bray match. Um... The Mojo Raleigh thing is kind of what we expected with him and Gronk. It's it's really weird that they're shoving it into a feud that is basically already there, and I guess a match that's going to be happening at Mania, which will be Elias versus Baron Corbin. That seems where they're going with that storyline, where Elias keeps interrupting Baron while Baron's being a dick to other people. Um, but obviously the Mojo thing, or not the Mojo thing, but the Gronk thing seems to be working because their ratings were actually up um, quite a bit from previous weeks. So. Uh, like I said, he's a big name. We talked about it on Wednesday. It, it's probably a good get considering there's no other sports on and having that big name and having ESPN talk about these things in a world with no sports currently is uh, very, very good for WWE. Um, so overall, I like the beginning of the show so far. Um, and, you know, the past match, I like your idea. It, to me, focus around be bigger. I mean, I know John Cena is a big star, but I don't know that that's the, the main event match. So maybe showing some, like, I don't know, uh, Roman Reigns or that Goldberg-Lesnar match. Uh, maybe both of those matches to show, like, last time Goldberg was champion, he destroyed Lesnar, got the title. And then they had that. Then you could show his match losing to Lesnar. That puts Lesnar over. Maybe some highlight packages of Drew McIntyre. To me, it's just the, the bigger matches they should be focusing on. And um, me not necessarily wanting to see a lot of Bray Wyatt's <laughs> matches. If I'm being completely honest, but I do, I do like that they at least seem to be listening to some feedback um, from not only our podcast but different podcasts and, and trying to go that route to help build these build these pay per views. It's a little weird that they're having to go to the back catalog to build the pay per view with older matches that these guys have had. Um, but with the John Cena one, it does make sense because the idea is that John Cena has beaten Bray and shamed his group in the past, and that's why the feed wants to attack. 
uh, John Cena instead of trying to win his title back or whatever. But yeah, I, I, I think that for the most part, there's not a whole lot for me to bitch about SmackDown other than it just still feels a little weird when the in ring action's happening. Yep. No, I can agree with you, and we'll we'll, we'll go through all the matches. Uh, but yeah, that that is the biggest aspect is like no audience reaction while matches are going on. But uh, we started off with Michael Cole and Mojo Raleigh uh, introducing Rob Gronkowski. Uh, apparently, Michael Cole did not have enough energy to Mojo Raleigh's uh, level, and so he got his ass smacked several times, and kind of looked like he got aggravated about it from Mojo Raleigh. Mojo gets the uh, you know the intro himself, and. Here comes Rob Gronkowski and uh, dancing his way to the ring, looking fratastic as ever. <laughs> um, Gronk was interrupted by King Corbin, who explained <laughs> to him that the NFL and WWE are very different. Uh, Elias interrupted, still trying to sing the song that he made about Baron Corbin. Uh, but Gronk pushed Corbin down. Gronk then made Corbin Elias uh, official for WrestleMania. So we're going to get, like you said, these two. I swear to God, the Polly D-like dance that Gronkowski did on the way to the ring was absolutely ridiculous. But, hey, if that's his personality, man, I don't want him to kind of stray away from it. I don't know a lot about Gronk myself. How would you like this opening? Yeah, I mean, Gronk comes off as a big kind of goofy guy, and that plays into his character. I mean, he does shit like that on the um, the Sunday pre-shows on the NFL. And, and when he did the New Year's Eve stuff, he was he was doing that. He was actually part of a little wrestling moment during the ball drop earlier this year. So I, I, I wish I would have... Well, we had been talking about Gronkowski doing something at Mania for a while, but that kind of pointed to, you know, with Fox being involved, definitely there was a huge possibility of that. But um, yeah, I like Gronk being kind of a huge goof. Once again, he's the host. Um, he's going to be probably announcing some other matches because I still don't think we have the full card now that this thing is split to two days just because I am not completely... Uh, <laughs> Complete. I even though they split it to two days, they're still going to try to jam this fucking thing full of matches because that's what WWE does. It's going to end up being probably five hours a day. Um, hopefully not. I, I would rather them just give us longer. <laughs> I would rather them give us longer good matches than just put a bunch of matches on the show. But uh, yeah, they've been building the uh, the Baron Elias thing. Even if you go back to last week when Baron, I guess, inter- like, who the hell did he interrupt? Was it Jeff Hardy? He inter- I guess it was Jeff Hardy he interrupted, right? Um, I don't know. Makes sense. Yeah. They're trying to push Elias as a baby face. And uh, I'm assuming eventually we're going to get to hear this song. Hopefully uh, it's it's been worth the wait and not like uh, Rowan's Cage. It just <laughs> got absolutely demolished by Drew McIntyre. I'm still laughing about that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, oh, I, I thought, thought it was a good first segment. And Gronkowski, I mean... He, at, you know, worst case scenario, he's a fun, he's a funny, goofy ex football player. They've had worst WrestleMania hosts in the past, so you know the fact they're putting him into the storyline and trying to build around him, and he's a Fox guy. It makes a lot of sense for WWE, and, and I thought he was fine in this segment. Still not a huge Mojo Rawley fan. I get that they're friends, and that's you know they're trying to build off. At least they're looking at the past and going, remember when Gronk helped Rawley? And I was like, yeah, I totally remember that. I also remember him getting stopped by like a female security guard that was five foot two. But <laughs> we should get the highlights of that. <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. But it is very true, you know. <laughs> that is one of the last memories that we have. But uh yeah, I'll I'll, I'll give it to uh Mojo for his energy. Let's just put it that way. But um Hey, if he's going to be somewhat of a manager for Gronk or vice versa, or if they're going to be some type of unit, as long as they're entertaining, you know, I think that's the main thing that matters and him being the host. Um, Hey, cool. Uh, Now, the Baron Corbin, Elias thing. I'll just say that Elias' biggest issue with his songs is the fact that he's, I think, fucking tone deaf a bit because he's always flat whenever he sings. Uh, you, you being a, a musician yourself too, Chris, do you agree with me on that? I swear to God, he just sounds like he's on the wrong, uh, I don't even remember, you know, note, if you will. I think he's came a long way from when he first started this gimmick. It's like he continued to try to learn how to play guitar. So he's at least he better at guitar. Now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what my my advice is if he sings to that tone and he can't hit 
let's say he can't get in that key, maybe tune the guitar all the way down to D. Like, yeah. it can, and then that might help him a little bit. Um, but, you know, that's whatever. That's a music lesson versus him as a wrestler. He's he's just a fucking wrestler that plays a guitar gimmick. So I, I, I don't pay that close yeah. of attention to it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's much more entertainment, so shouldn't really go that bad into it. But we had a, a promo afterwards, and I heard that UFC's taken advantage of this. Uh, since ESPN doesn't have a lot to do besides documentaries and, you know, whatever they can get their hands on and pass uh, basketball games and whatnot, uh, they're actually getting uh, some UFC stuff and some WWE stuff. So I think tonight or all day, uh, at, at some point, they're going to be doing nonstop, I think, main event matches for UFC in the past, some of the big ones. And then WWE is going to be airing, uh, at least on Sundays, I believe, uh, different WrestleManias. And they're starting off with WrestleMania 30, which is what they had that Bray wyatt John Cena match from, uh, to you know, kind of give it for something to watch. I think that's actually pretty smart. Also, taking advantage of, of a really terrible situation like this, you know, it, if there's nothing else for sports fans to watch, they kind of used to watch wrestling back in the day, or maybe they they watched UFC back in the day or something like that. Giving them more modern stuff uh, like matches or pay per views to you know show them, hey, we got this. You know, I, I think it's a, a very smart idea business wise. Yeah, the only thing I would say is if they could, it, I I would nitpick the matches I showed, like give everyone the top ones and mix in some older stuff too. You know, like uh, to get those older, maybe the what we like to call, I guess, as we talk about shit on the podcast, those laps fans, something from their childhood. Um, maybe throw some of that stuff in too. Just don't show the last like three manias, and I mean they're like eight hours a piece, <laughs> so <laughs> maybe just show the best of or YouTube clip it or do something. Uh, If it was me, I would, well, eh, they have enough minds there that they could even do the round table like they used to do uh, back when they had the on-demand station. All that stuff is on the network, too. We've talked about it on the show, which is they'll kind of break down a match but talk about what was going on behind the scenes and um, talk about each of the people that are in the match and kind of build off of that. I think they could do their own version of that with maybe the backstage crew and, and maybe even some guys from ESPN who are, former wrestling fans, etc. Um, there's some neat stuff they can do around it. I think this is a good opening start. And I like the idea of, you know, both companies are kind of taking a hit right now. Let's, let's work together. Let's, let's uh, give people something to watch during this weird time in the world. And it's, it's cool. It's cool stuff in general. And that kind of harkens back to what we were saying on Wednesday. Um, what, did, what did you say? Making lemonade out of dog shit. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you got to make some lemonade, I guess. I don't know how you get from brown to yellow, but you can figure out a way, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so we had a match with Daniel Bryan and Drew Gulak. Really like their, I like their chemistry together. This is something that Chris kind of suggested, and then they just went with it the next week um, after their match. And uh, their chemistry is great. Uh, we had them against two great opponents, Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura. The only problem was that that this match was short, and if they're trying to you know, uh, get time in there. If they're going to play past matches, they might as well let the wrestling matches flesh out a bit, I think. I think it was more It was more for, for what's his name, Sami Zayn, to be, you know, himself behind the microphone and stuff like that and go back-to-back with Michael Cole, and that's kind of how their mentality is sometimes when they do shit like that. But this, uh, Cesaro and Nakamura and Zayn um, group is now known as the Artist Collective. It sounds like a terrible, like, fucking indie pop name or some shit. Um, it, does, it sounds like they just threw two words into a random band name generator and was like, fuck, oh. this, is our, this is our group name. I will yeah. say it's still better than Boston Hug Connection. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> um, there's, there's a lot of stuff that, that's better. Than, <laughs> that's like the bare minimal, you know? Um Anyways, uh, Brian pins Cesaro with the sunset flip despite not being the legal man. Um, after the match, Brian challenged Zayn to an Intercontinental Championship match at WrestleMania. Zayn said he'd agree if Gulak could defeat Shinsuke Nakamura next week. So it looks like we're going to have at WrestleMania, it's going to be uh, Daniel Bryan versus Sami Zayn for the Intercontinental title. And I'm sure a bunch of hijinks from people interfering. Maybe, possibly, even Chris Drew Gulak fucking over 
Daniel Bryan at it and joining uh, the the artist collective. What do you think about all this? Well, I mean, obviously, I think to, to me, Drew Gulak and, and Daniel Bryan are kind of a perfect tag team, and maybe they're looking at like the Broser Weights as an example of that, um, and kind of using that as like, hey, we could do this with uh, Daniel. He's got nothing going on. It's a good way to uh, <laughs> to build up uh, Drew Gulak as well. So I don't expect him to actually turn into the Nightmare Collective. I thought it was a decent little match. It was a little short for my taste, considering the people that they had in the ring. I mean, you have Daniel Bryan and fucking Cesaro and Drew Gulak. Um, and, and Shinsuke, you know, he can be Shinsuke when he needs to be. I, I felt like they could have gave him more time, but like you said, this is more. This match was more about Sami Zayn than it was kind of the other people that were in the match, other than fleshing out maybe that tag team between uh, Brian and Gulak. It was nice to see them. Uh, let's see. Let me pull up match notes again. Fuck, who won this match? <laughs> Gulak and Brian. I was going to say it was nice to see them. Yeah, I was going to say it was nice to see them get a win, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget and get it wrong. Um, yeah, it was good. nice to get, nice to see them get a strong win um, and kind of build that tag team because I think they'll be that. I mean, if they keep that thing going and they get past this feud and they keep them as a tag team, then you have them versus the Usos, then versus the New Day, then versus Ms. Morrison, and I mean Gulak and Brian are fucking phenomenal wrestlers. So keeping them as a little group. Um, for a while, you got that great. that one part wrong. It's uh, hey hey ho ho, Miz and Morrison. Sorry, I'm not not, <laughs> not doing that. <laughs> I'm not, not doing, doing that. that. <laughs> I mean, uh, what's Shorty G doing? Why don't they just form a a group of pure technicians? And uh, <laughs> that would be that could be really really fun if they decide to. For Brian to turn back heel, or if they want to, I mean, to me, what they're going to do is build them up to tag champions. Then uh, you get the split between those two, and you get like a really good Gulak Daniel Bryan match again. That would be my thought on where they're probably going going with this thing. Yeah, um, it's going to be interesting seeing Zayn and Brian though. Uh, they should be able to pull off a great match. Anyways, so Paige called via Skype, but was interrupted by Sasha Banks and Bailey. They went out, they talked shit. They, you know, Paige said that she was going to name the match uh, for WrestleMania for Bailey. And uh, basically, we got a breakdown of Lacey Evans, Dana Brooke, Tamina, Naomi, and Sasha Banks in a six pack challenge. Um, I mean, these matches are shenanigans. My biggest wonder, though, is where's Camilla? We know that her and Corey are gone. I don't think that they have, like, the disease. I don't know if they were like, look, we're going to lay low for this thing. I don't know exactly what's going on there. But um, they're absolutely missing on, uh, you know, uh, Corey for, from commentating and then obviously Carmella from wrestling. And I was surprised that she wasn't in this match, especially putting in someone like Tamina. Seems like there's probably more to that. We'll find out, I guess, in the future. But... Uh, Sasha did not seem too angry about being added to the match. Um, out of these women listed, I feel like Lacey Evans or Sasha Banks are going to get the title, possibly with Naomi. I don't think Bailey is going to have this belt after WrestleMania. How did you like the segment? How did you like Paige? And how do you like the uh, the match announcement? I like the segment. It was good seeing Paige back in, in uh, more of a TV role. Um, I know that she's been on backstage, but it was good seeing her back to proper SmackDown. Um, I like I like your idea of Bailey dropping the title. I don't know that I want it to be Sasha Banks right off the bat. And the reason I say that is that feud has never really clicked or worked. Um, and then, you know, those two would have to feud with one another, essentially, if, if Sasha wins the title. I mean, it would be good for Sasha, but it also... Not really if she gets stuck in a, a weird, shitty feud with Bailey, who's now a heel, which might make it even worse to some extent. Um, I think maybe the logical thing is to put the belt on Naomi. I feel like the crowd still likes Naomi a lot. Could be another big WrestleMania moment. It's in Tampa. She's from Florida. Um, obviously, you know, she had the big win in Miami a few years back. Um, and she's looked great since coming back from Royal Rumble, other than that very awkward spot. Uh <laughs> In the rumble itself, I think maybe they overthought that a little bit too much. But uh, outside of that, um, it should be a good match. It'll, it'll be fun. I mean, it's going to be overshadowed by the other two uh, female wrestling matches that are on that card, which is a little unfortunate to, to these cats. But WWE's definitely put their focus on Charlotte and Becky as being the top, 
female wrestlers and then trying to get Rhea and Shayna over is the next big thing. Whereas, like, you know, to me, to some extent, Sasha and Bailey are still being punished. Well, it's well, it's not really fair to Bailey, so to speak, but Sasha, to me, for to some extent, is still being punished for taking that time off, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I can definitely see that. All right, so they reach the uh, they the uh, blah, sorry about that. They re-showed the Bray Wyatt versus John Cena match from WrestleMania 30 uh, in its entirety to give you know some reasoning behind the storyline of why Bray Wyatt is the way he is as a fiend. He's claiming that it's centered from this feud. Uh, the match itself, I honestly hadn't watched this match before. I've, I've well, maybe I have. I just didn't remember it, but. It made me realize that JBL is pretty damn good at commentating, especially throughout this match with, um, I think it was Michael Cole and King. And uh, just the whole breakdown and concept, much more of a, like it wasn't a technical masterpiece by any means. It did have John Cena doing a pretty awesome crossbody to the outside against Rowan and um, and and the, uh, the now Brody Lee. Um, but Bray was trying to get John to go over the line. He was trying to get him to take him out, to get away from his Boy Scout ways. And John almost, you know, went into it. He, he even threw a chair at him. I thought it was very, very uh, good storytelling on that aspect. Um, but it kind of gives, like, what they're trying to go for, uh, more meat to the storyline of what's going on. Like I said, there's some other big feuds I hope that they incorporate this concept with going forward if they're going to show old matches. Uh, Chris, did you rewatch the match, or did, were you like, I already saw this, so, you know, I'm going to go to the bathroom? <laughs> so I, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I kind of half-ass paid attention to it. Um, I was, like, looking at Twitter and guitar shit online during this match. I, I, I mean, I've seen this match two or three times in the past. Um, and it's just very similar to a lot of the Wyatt family matches where they're like, oh, they're going to turn this guy evil. I mean, look at like Orton or Daniel Bryan. They did that same storyline a lot. Um, JBL was pretty good on commentary from from what I recall of the parts that I did watch. Um, but to me, JBL's never – like his commentary, I know a lot of people didn't like it, but I kind of liked the, more of the old school ex-wrestler heel commentary that he would do. Certain groups he didn't work with. Obviously, him and Morrow didn't get along, so that was a little bit of a – always a weird commentary group. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I still like that they're trying to build meat to the story. I think there's some other matches that they could do, specifically on Raw, like you said, with uh, Rated RKO, or, you know, uh, even past Lesnar matches, or highlight rules between Drew McIntyre. They need to build up their big matches. Um, and if the idea is to put the belt back on Sasha maybe so show some really good Sasha matches like her versus Charlotte or, you know, I mean, even one of her past matches with Bailey, maybe show that damn NXT match between Becky, um, Sasha, Charlotte, and Bailey. That would be one that kind of puts all of those people over who are also currently all going to be in big matches on at mania. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it, it, once again, it adds me to the story. I like the crossover with ESPN. Um, it's not, you know, it's still better than most television matches they're going to put on. But once again, I'm not, I, I can't think of a really great Bray Wyatt match right off hand, except for like what, what Daniel Bryan has been able to drag out of him recently. I can't, there's just nothing that comes to mind when I think of Bray Wyatt matches. So, um, one that I've already seen before, I'm not going to be super excited about seeing again, usually. Yeah, I can, I, I understand that. I actually, like I said, the storytelling was great. I've never seen Bray pull off that much, I guess, athletic stuff. Um, but, you know, it's going to be him and Cena. Should be good. Hey, have you heard this theory? It's it's not, it doesn't have any type of validity to it. It's kind of like the Simpsons theory about the creator being from the future or the Rugrats theory, which if you guys want to go down a rabbit hole, go look up that. Um, but... It's about how Matt Hardy is linked to a lot of stuff going forward, and that basically The Fiend, even if he developed, if they're trying to say back when John Cena, the actual physical embodiment of The Fiend, he's a conduit, Chris, for the lake of reincarnation, because everyone he's had a major feud with has changed dramatically within them. You know, Finn Balor is now kind of more of this badass Prince Devitt concept from the past, you have Seth Rollins that's gone to his whatever-the-fuck, Daniel Bryan, 
ended up embodying more of his, you know, older style. It's it's like Matt Hardy has left his imprint throughout everything and used Bray Wyatt as his thing to, you know, get through everything. And that means that both Matt and Bray have something in on, you know, the Dark Order because of Brody Lee and also a giant animatronic spider. Never mind. Don't worry about Rowan and, uh, and Harper. But have you have you heard this concept <laughs> that he's like, he's he's basically the living concept of the lake and reincarnation you know, fiend, if you will no i haven't but i could see people piecing that together and uh it would make a lot more sense if matt would have stayed <laughs> now now it's yes. WWE. it's wwe so they're gonna completely forget that that shit happened especially now that matt's not there so i think it's just you know bray being bray for the most part um and they pretty much killed that storyline off anyways didn't he come back as like matt's tag partner for a while, and then just disappeared, and then came back as the Fiend when Matt was still there. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's, I don't know. It, it's I mean, still fun. It, Someone wrote it up, and they kind of like connected the dots, and I was like, oh, that's a fun theory. Yeah, got it. yeah that's that's fun. It's, it, it is very much like that David Lynch <laughs> Rugrats theory of, of Tommy actually being dead or whatever. Um, so fucked up, man. <laughs> I could, I could, I could see people drawing the connections. And hey, man, if that's what, if that's what you see the wrestling storyline as, and it, that you have fun with that, then awesome. Um, sometimes I wish that I could go back to like my childhood and have these kind of thoughts. Uh, I think that I've watched too much wrestling for for my brain to do that at times. So the suspension of disbelief, the telling of your own story in your head, I. I have a bit of problem with sometimes, and that's a me thing. But uh, yeah, I mean that's a fun theory for sure, and it would have been really cool if Matt could have stuck around and they fleshed that out after reading it on Reddit or something. Um, <laughs> that could have been really Reddit. interesting. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see Matt Hardy go down a different path, but really, in a, I enjoyed reading that. I thought that was very creative. And uh, another creative thing that we didn't ta- that I found out uh, recently is. Uh, Matt Hardy was talking to Chris Jericho on uh, Talk Is Jericho, and they did um, they did a uh, what call it the night after Dynamite, so I guess on Thursday they did a interview, and uh, come to find out, not only lots of comparisons, and hopefully this leads up to something in the future between Darby and Jeff, uh, even going to like you know Jeff has like a course for fucking dirt bike, and that's what he's into Supercross and stuff. Darby has a whole entire skateboarding thing, but on his property. Not only did Darby Allen record Chris, his segment where he took the body, uh, well, what's supposed to be the body of Sammy Guevara for a ride, we'll say, but that's actually where uh, they recorded that match. That's actually Darby Allen's uh, ring. So where the hell is Darby Allen? I think he lives in the South. I'm pretty sure he lives in Georgia, but uh, pretty cool house, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I, so I haven't heard the uh, the full interview with Matt Hardy. Is, is was that worth like a, a listen for sure? That's something I should be checking out. I really loved it, and it wasn't like a slam fest of WWE. They kind of were just realistic about business, and Matt and him just talk about what he wants to do going forward. And yeah, it was it was a it was a fun interview, especially you know for the little segment there. There, you know, uh, Chris was talking about Darby Allen, how much he reminded him of his brother. Yeah, and I mean, I kind of figured that Matt wasn't going to come out and slam WWE because Jeff is still there under contract. <laughs> so it probably wouldn't be a good move for for him as far as his brother is concerned. But um, so that was Darby Allen's house that they they used. Is that what you were saying for the? Uh, I'm assuming yeah. for that Lance Archer promo. Yeah, the Lance Archer uh, Jake the Snake's uh, thing. Well, that answers our question. We were trying to figure out if it was Jake the Snake's house or GDP's house, but it definitely looks like somewhere here in Georgia. Even my wife was like, that looks like it's here. Um, so cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm going to go cool check it out. I, cool <laughs> stuff. I'll elves. <laughs> no, I mean, I haven't, heard the, I haven't heard the podcast, so I don't have the full context of the conversation, so that's on me. Um, I'm not doing my due diligence as a wrestling reporter right now, I guess. My, my fault, guys. <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. The, you know, just don't worry about it. All right, so this is Arnold. You got to Arnold. And you would keep on going with this stuff. Uh, and no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, no, Alexa I will Bliss. Say that, 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 
I, I will say that you know that segment in general in AEW I thought was really really good, and I like that uh, that Lance Archer's kind of gimmick right now, as my friend said, is he's just a guy that tries to kill people in the woods that hangs out with an old crackhead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wouldn't put it that way, but that is a good, that is a good description. Oh, man. Um, funny. <laughs> so, it definitely, to me, that whole thing just has, like, this House of a Thousand Corpses type feel to it when you go back and watch that promo segment from AEW with Jake. I think Lance Archer I think, just murdering people in the woods. I think Darby Allen would appreciate that. I wonder if his uh, production stuff, you know, that he does was anything to do with that segment. Um but yeah, let's uh, let's get back on track. We kind of went down a rabbit hole because of me, several of them. Um, but uh, you know, getting out of uh, Alice's Wonderland, let's get to Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. We're interviewed backstage, and basically, Bliss challenged Oscar to a match for next week. I'm assuming they're going to try to throw something in there with if she wins. I don't remember her saying this, but you know, she's going to expect a title shot and we're probably inevitably going to get Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross against the Kabuki Warriors for the Women's Tag Team Championships that haven't been defended in, I think, six months, um, if not more. Uh, what did you think about this interview, Chris? I thought the interview itself was fine. I have no idea what the hell they're doing with those two. So... <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, I think we lost uh, connection there for a second. I, I thought the interview itself was uh, very good. I still don't know where they're going. I mean, I, I'm assuming they asked about the Kabuki Warriors. So is the idea that they're just going to have a pre-show match with Oscar and Carrie Zane? Yeah, for the, for the title. women's titles. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I guess I'm okay with that. Maybe, well, actually, maybe it won't be on the pre-show because it splits to two days. Um, I mean, if anyone can pull a good match out of of Alexa and <laughs> Alexa and uh, what Nikki Cross, it, it it would be the Kabuki Warriors. They're both fucking phenomenal. It's just such a they don't have any other female tag teams, and they've done a really shitty job of building them. So once again, it's I don't know. It's just one of those weird things that I'm kind of done with. I. I I wish that they would put more focus on it or just disband the titles and let us have Kerry Zane and Asuka doing other cool shit. I, I um, just feel if you're going to have the titles, put it on NXT. You know what I'm saying, Chris? Like, they'll actually utilize it. They have a huge female roster. They could put together a couple tag teams. You know, I just don't understand why it's it, – they got called out for it because they never go to SmackDown. They never go to SmackDown. They never go to NXT. They're always on Raw, and they haven't been defended. And you have two awesome wrestlers, you know – I don't know. It just seems like if you're going to – I don't see the point. I think you were right to begin with. There was really no point for these titles. You know, They just didn't have enough female talent to be able to utilize it, and they don't know how to book it. I mean, they have tons of female talent if they maybe held a tag tournament where people had a reason to join teams and create tag teams out of that. And like you said, if they actually took these things to NXT where they have a huge female roster um, kind of like the great athletes. Class. Yeah, I mean, there's tons of cool, like, you know, we just saw the Broser weights get created out of nowhere. I'm sure there's ways to do this. It's just, I don't, you know, main roster tag teams in general already have enough uh, problems <laughs> without throwing an additional set of tag belts on there with no one to defend them against. And, uh, yeah, I mean, to me, it's, the whole thing is that it's Asuka's single matches with Kerry interfering, for the most part. Like, they've only used that as as ways for them to be heels, not as them actually being a tag team, in my opinion. But, uh, it, you know, either get rid of the titles or have them start going everywhere with them <clears throat> or have them lose the titles because, to me, you're just wasting two people by... you're Like, Asuka could be having a main event match against someone else. Like, there's a lot of cool shit you could do. Like, you could easily break them up and then have them have a match at Mania. That would be one of yeah. the best matches on the card, probably, between Kerry Zane and Asuka if you gave them time to work. So that part of it's frustrating. But as far as the promo, it was fine. I mean, it should be a decent match. It's just, don't care about the itself. And then also, like, Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss, to me, has kind of ran its course considering originally Alexa was a heel, and then they decided to turn her baby face. And uh, I guess they went away from... To me, they were going for that Trish Stratus uh, storyline back in the day, and then they decided to go away from that. <clears throat> and then they kind of 
went there with Mandy Rose, or I guess still are going there to some extent, but then they went away from that. Um, they like they they've started and stopped. Kind of, I don't want to. I watch my wording carefully, but a lesbian love angle storyline between two females. They've started and stopped it in multiple places. They did it on Raw. They did it on SmackDown uh, with two different people. Um, and they did it with Nikki Cross and Alex Bliss as kind of like Nikki being over, overly stalky and almost kind of in love with Alexa and doing anything she would say, etc. Um, you've just seen the storyline get start and stop so many times, maybe they should just scrap it. Um, yeah, or actually use it with the original people and go with the person that's actually a lesbian in real life. <laughs> but so he did, <laughs> I know that they're now kind of a part of a different storyline that everyone likes, but they were the original ones that asked for it and somehow became Lana and Liv Morgan, which, what the fuck happened to that? But then they went back to it because you had that whole segment at Rumble with um, Otis that's from right, Machine. where she was, she was the one who was texting through uh, – through Mandy's phone to fuck over Otis and told him to like, you know, come later. So, and then, yeah. And it changed. And then it just changed completely to an angle between Otis and Dolph Ziggler. And then they just like completely forgot. <laughs> so it's I think just, Sonya would kick Otis's ass. I think that's probably why that's probably that's, why. <laughs> no way. No one would only kick Otis's ass. Everybody loves Otis. <laughs> He's just a big lovable. oof. Oh Yeah. <laughs> I just can't wait till he starts selling like a a t shirt with his face outline on it, like Kool Aid Man. That'd be a marketing team needs to get on that. Just an outline of his face, like the Kool Aid Man on a red shirt. Let's let's do oh that shit. God. All right. So, uh, <laughs> well, speaking of which, we had the the SmackDown tag team uh, match. The Miz and John Morrison going against Heavy Machinery. I don't remember if it's established for the title. Um, my source with Uproxx, they they said it was a championship match. I don't remember that. Uh, th- what does your note say, Chris? Well, hold on. Let me. Uh, oh, sorry. I put my 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 computer locked up here. I'll break down the match while you look that up. I was just wondering if this was for the championship belt. Just interrupt me. Um, before uh, the match, Vincent Morrison hosted the dirt sheet and dressed up as the New Day, the o- Usos, and Heavy Machinery uh, to have some fun, make it kind of funny, showing that basically we're on SmackDown compared to NXT and uh, AEW, especially our wrestling shows, while obviously we're on SmackDown are variety shows. Um, were you about to tell me? Yeah, so from what I can see, it was a non-title match. Oh, okay. um, that's what I thought. Which... I could see, but I don't remember them even saying anything about it, right? Nope. So I think the idea was that if Heavy Machinery won this match, it would be them facing Miz and Morrison. I think it was supposed to be a number one contenders match. It didn't matter because it ended in a DQ. So even if it was a fucking title match, it wouldn't have yeah. mattered anyways. But uh, well, I would be pissed off if I was Tucker if it was a title match <laughs> or Tucky. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so basically the whole thing is they were having a pretty good tag match. Uh, Tucker was just getting annihilated for the most part. And, um, you know, Dolph Ziggler came out basically right when the comeback was going to happen. And the hot tag, uh, to basically, uh, Otis was distracted. He came out with his music and then went and, uh, got on commentary. And I gotta say, Dolph is really good at playing a scumbag, but he literally, did absolutely nothing in all this. Michael Cole being creepily, you know, I, I, I've been the guy before, I'll admit it, that got a little bit too caught up and nothing ended up happening with me and a female. And I just don't think that Dolph really fucking did anything so far. But tonight he kind of, uh, you know, might have gone, you know, past that line. But uh, he taunted um, Instagram photos of Ziggler with Mandy Rose, uh, which pissed off Otis. And Otis became enraged, attacked everyone, and then started, you know, uh, going at Miz and Morrison with the steel chair, screwing up their, um, their I guess, their their ability to get a future match and a future title match. And next week, the Usos will wrestle the New Day with the winner challenging the SmackDown Tag Team Champions at WrestleMania. That should be good. I don't know who will win out of that. That will be the tag team, it seems. So Miz and Morrison versus either the New Day or the Usos for the titles. 
obviously Otis is going to probably have a match with Dolph Ziggler. Um, I would say with shenanigans uh, from their tag team partners, maybe it'll be a tag team match. I, it could be. Now they have two nights. I would just think that if they wanted to, this is going to be a grudge match between Otis and Ziggler. But I really originally didn't think Ziggler did much, and then he kind of flaunted a bit. So, you know, Otis, I, I like seeing Otis angry. I also liked Otis breaking down and crying to Tucker. Like, it actually made me feel bad. Like, a lot of people just wouldn't have that sympathy with me or believability, but I really like Otis. He's kind of like Eugene meets Dusty Rhodes, you know? Okay, that was a terrible comparison. I'm bad for saying that. Yeah, I, I don't know how that would say he's Eugene meets Dusty Rhodes, but he is a lovable character. I think every I think it's because some it's because I think um, it's because everyone knows someone kinda like this guy in real life. You know what I mean? God. Like uh yeah. overly excited, overly emotional to some extent, very just always on, probably listens to like bad music but doesn't care that he listens to bad music and will tell you about the bad music he listens to. Kind and he guy. might be a human peen, beanbag, you know? Um, maybe <laughs> well, Hacksaw Jim is... Duggan's a better example than um, my other choice. Now that, again, that Eugene is a... Hacksaw is a very similar concept. Yeah, there's just something very lovable about him, which, that I mean, Hacksaw's a perfect example. Because, I mean, he kind of is just doing the Hacksaw Jim Duggan thing. A little more depth to his character, but, I mean, is kind of just the lovable guy that yelled, Oh! for like a long, long time, and notice instead of, oh, it's, oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But they are they are fleshing that character out, and he's one of my favorite people to watch on SmackDown, and uh, this is no exception. I thought it was great. What I will say is that the match itself was pretty good. It was it was actually longer than the the other tag match. My question would be, do they do a fuck finish next week, and then they just set up like a multi-man tag match for night one, and then whoever wins that gets a title shot the following night? Because to me, that would be a way to continue the storyline, plus you can build out you know, a singles match out of that if you wanted to. So utilize the fact that you have two nights to set up a storyline for night two to keep people invested in both nights of Mania outside of just, like, here's the matches. Yeah, that's a... Uh, it'll be interesting once it breaks down, but I think that's a better choice than the random way that they're going to go about it, most likely. Um... Let's go to the last segment that closed out the show. We had the contract signing between Roman Reigns and Goldberg uh, for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship uh, for WrestleMania. Um, I thought Roman Reigns was awesome in this. I really did. I thought that he was direct. Um, I can't, he made a comment about Goldberg, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was direct, and it was aggressive. And both guys you – know, oh, oh, no, it was – Michael Cole going back on comments of Roman throwing some jabs on Twitter about, you know, they're asking if it hurts to punch the uh, steel entrance. And he was like, there's padding there. I'll be fine. I'm not some idiot like uh, other past wrestlers that bang their head against doors, you know, and Goldberg's first response and Goldberg, he was fine with everything. He's been pretty good at promos recently within WWE, I think very much intensity, but his comment first to him is like, he's like, there's been plenty of steel doors I've banged my head on with that headbutt. And I'm like, well, do you really want to admit that? Like, is that that part of your brain that's been hit by that headbutt <laughs> so many fucking times? Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I love that. I also yeah. love the uh, Sami Zayn when, when um, Michael Cole says something to Sami Zayn. He's like, a lot of people – or he's, he's like, I'm glad that you're, you're, you're not talking to me anymore. And he goes, a lot of people are happy they're not talking to you, Michael Cole. Like, there was a lot of good stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that kind of goes back to what Triple H was doing with Michael Cole the other day um, on commentary, which was really, really funny. Uh, the Goldberg hitting his head thing, didn't that have, like, shades of, of Sid Vicious to a lot of <laughs> a lot of ways? Yeah. <laughs> I'm half the man that you think I am with half the brain that you have, or whatever that promo was. That's kind of what it... That's kind of what it came off me as. I better be careful or Goldberg will block me on Twitter again for his improper <laughs> use of the word your. Oh, what a fucking mook. Um, but, yeah, I, I, other than that, I thought it was a good signing. Both guys signed it. I think uh, Roman called him a dinosaur or some shit like that. But Roman's been great. Fucking table gets thrown, and that's the two of them with a stare down that was really intense. And, you know, this is where – the the concept of wrestling where it goes into the believability aspect 
I really do believe that there's a little bit of tension between the two of them. I'm thinking that Roman's kind of fucking sick of situations like this happening, like you said in his promo last week. And if you watch Goldberg in any of these documentaries, ugh, you know, he really kind of gets aggravated that he's called out for being the old guy that's coming back because he's a name and shit like that. So, you know, I thought it was a good way to end the show. And uh, like I said, man, I think that Roman, <laughs> I know it's it's not just because people are not booing him, but I think given the atmosphere, uh, given what's happened, he's been a lot more direct and a lot more aggressive and kind of shown us a different side with this feud with Goldberg. Do you agree, Chris? I do agree with you, and I think fans are, are going to be a little bit more lenient because you're going to have that side of the audience that just doesn't give a shit about Goldberg um, <laughs> coming back. I mean, we hear about it all the time. Why do they always bring these old guys back? I mean, they, they obviously pop the ratings, and there are those fans that are there for those people, but um, to some extent, it kind of reminds me of the Rock versus Cena feud in the way that the promos are going between those two, where the Rock's like doing shit via satellite, and John Cena's like, I've been here for years. I, I never left, et cetera, which is funny because now John Cena's basically that guy, but um, it kind of has that feel to it, to me at least, it, it, with the same thing with the Rock and uh, Cena build that they did, which is where I thought they were going to go with this, in all honesty. And um, to me, I like that they're letting Roman more come off more like himself it doesn't sound as scripted and they should probably stick with that because i'm sure roman's a very like from watching ride along and stuff he has way more personality than they normally let him show and uh as everyone knows me and you are roman fans so <laughs> i yeah, like even, this and, thus and far i forgot who chris jericho was talking to recently he was interviewing someone and he said directly that he goes wwe just doesn't know how to book roman like when it comes to showing off his personality this guy is so cool, one of the coolest guys I know, and they just make him so monotone and flat most of the time. But Roman's a nice guy, and he has the respect of all the guys in the locker room. So, once again, it's that type of situation, and you can say he's got four or five fucking moves. So do all of the big guys that were at top. You know, I hate to say it, one of my favorite wrestlers, Shawn Michaels, or even someone modern like an AJ Styles, are just not going to have that type of gravitas selling power like a Stone Cold Steve Austin or a Hulk Hogan or a Rock, or John Cena, or now Roman Reigns, because and they all had a limited move set. You know, it was more of the entertainment aspect as opposed to the wrestling aspect when it became an in-ring performer type. And Cody has that for going on. You know, yeah, and I, and I would say that you did the people who say that should actually go back and watch some more recent um, Roman matches because I think he's fleshed out his offense quite a bit. I mean, he's still got his signature moves. But so does everyone. It's just the fact that Roman was pushed so hard for so long that people kind of give him that John Cena five moves of doom or the Hogan five moves of doom thing. When If you really look at it, most wrestlers have, I mean, like Jericho, for instance, has five signature spots that he's going to hit in every match. Like the corner drop kick from the apron, yep. right? The lion salt. Your, uh, the, Ju yep. well, the Judas effect. The code breaker. And the lion tamer. Those are like his five big spots. The rest of the time he's just selling his ass off. I mean, he's going to hit clotheslines and, like, throw a drop kick here or there and then just mostly brawl. So, like, to point that out, you can kind of point that out about any wrestler. Like, look at Jericho's matches. Um, now, granted, Jericho has been given a lot more to work with than Roman as of late, especially if you go back and watch those Corbin matches. Meanwhile, like, Jericho is fucking right <laughs> wrestling. <laughs> Jericho is wrestling Tanahashi. Um, <laughs> so it's a little easier to point out people's faults, but I, I would say, you know, five moves of doom, like any big top name guy, they're going to have those five signature spots because they're told to give those five signature spots over. And I, even you could say the same thing about Austin. Like I said, Austin corner, butthole stomp, right? Luthez press, stunner. I mean, like you could, he's going to hit all three Second of those. Second rope, elbow. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the same thing. Or the, the, you know, from the middle of the body, them on the ground, he'll go back and they'll come back and do that elbow drop. He does their face, you know, it's so even, all right. I'll break it down. Break it down. <laughs> Shawn Michaels, they, honestly, he does a lot of athletic stuff, and he'll take more risks, but you know what he's going to do, what his greatest hits are. You know, he's got a moonsault. He's obviously got two ways of doing the, the super kick, one that's out of nowhere, and the other one where he pumps it up and, and two, gets the band going or whatever the fuck. I forgot already that phrasing. You know, he's got up the, the band. <laughs> exactly. He's got the elbow drop. He's got the, the uh, running... Uh, you know, uh, running punch and then kick up thing that he does, the running forearm, I should say. You know, every wrestler has that. I just, 
it's it, you don't have to have an, an overly ridiculous, complicated moon set to be a great wrestler. I, I would say it, more it of the problem. That. More of the problem, and the reason that it's more focused on people like Roman Reigns is they give them ten minute matches. If you want to give him a longer match, like for for instance, him versus the Undertaker, he had to do a lot more shit in that match. But like, if you're only having an eight minute match and you got to get all of your signatures in, it's gonna look like five moves of doom. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, like fucking Lesnar's got three moves, but he makes those three moves look awesome. I think more of the problem with like Roman's move set is they're all like huge impact moves, like the Superman punch, the spear, that that uh, fucking what is it, the drive by or whatever. They're all just these like big out like huge spots as opposed to like just a normal signature, I guess, more than anything else. But like I said, I mean, if if people are still stuck on that five moves of doom thing, pick out your favorite fucking wrestler, someone from the modern era, and I guarantee you there's going to be five signature things they do, including their finisher. Like, spot on. doesn't matter. Anyone that's ever been to the top is going to have five moves that are super over that they utilize in their matches. It's just fucking how wrestling works. Yep. I mean, the only exception is if you go to, like, New Japan, where they do, like a bazillion fucking moves and the matches are like 30, 40 minutes long. But that's but even, the difference. Even like someone like, uh, all right, Okada. Okada is one of our favorite wrestlers. Um, I would say that he's got stuff that it's like his greatest hits. It, it's, it's, I don't know if it's five, it might surpass that, but he might do other stuff outside of the realm, you know, but he's going to be known for doing a shotgun, not like some type of shotgun drop kick, one off the top rope usually, He'll do the crossbody outside after he throws him over the rail and, and, and you know, do the crossbody over that. Um, and then he's got a variety of ways to set up his his finisher, basically. So, uh, or Tanahashi, he does, he, does, uh, he does the frog splash, he does a frog splash crossbody, he does the, um, the hell, the cloverleaf, you know. I don't think it's a bad thing. It, it, it's, it's also different in-ring styles. We know that the WWE, unfortunately for a lot of us, has just been kind of watered down and much more formulaic. And like you said, when you got 10 minutes of proof stuff, it looks like you're just going through your best moves because you don't have a lot to flesh out. But any ending-wise yeah. with SmackDown, before I give it out for your last comments about it, I thought it was a good ending. I thought the stare-down was good, and it was aggressive. It did make me a little bit more excited about this match, and I know Roman's probably going to get the belt afterwards. I hope. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's no sense for Roman not to get the belt. I liked Roman's promo here. I liked his promo um, last week, the sit-down with Cole in the, in the middle of the ring. So I like that they're fleshing that out. I like the back and forth on Twitter. I feel like they should show some really good, like, some really big Roman moments. Maybe even some of the uh, the Shield stuff. Or I, There's ways that they can push all these guys that are in these big matches because they've all had matches against each other. So hopefully with uh, with the ESPN and stuff, they'll start showing some of that, and that'll help build to Mania as well. Um, and then, yeah, the five moves of Doom. Like I said, if you feel that way about Roman, just pick your favorite wrestler, watch like five of their matches, and try to watch some of maybe of their TV matches from the WWE era, and you're going to see that come across with the majority of the wrestlers. Even like one of my favorites, Kevin Owens, has like five spots I know he's going to get in in every match. That's just WWE to a lot of extent, and like I said, it's also them not having as much time to flesh their shit out. Yep, I agree. All right, well, uh, let's start off this fun, fun concept, or uh, the Observing Wrestlers Hall of Fame. Uh, we are going to go through our list of 10 that we suggested to each other to be a part of this, and then we're going to figure out five. We've got to figure out five wrestlers. So the way I thought about doing this, Chris, we both list our 10. People know what they are. And then I don't know. Who, it doesn't really matter who starts. Uh, you can, if you'd like, you know, one of us suggests a wrestler that can kind of lead the list, uh, whether it be from the 10 that you have or the 10 that I have. And then we kind of debate if there's a strong, if, if, if there's a strong no against a suggested person, we put them to the side and we keep on moving until we can remove a couple people. But, you know, I think that it's going to come down to us having similar choices, possibly. Um, but since that's going to be, you know, kind of the way that we're going to do it, uh, what is your 10 wrestlers that you suggested since... You kind of gave me the 10 wrestlers that you picked, and I was like, all right, well, I'm not going to pick some of those guys because they're my favorites, and then I picked 10 based on that. 
All right. So we kind of did have a little bit of a, like, I don't want to say a requirement, but things that we wanted to accomplish with the list, which is to, one, have some Japanese wrestlers on the list itself. Um, also have some older guys. And in, the way I built my list, I, I tried to put in some older guys. Um, and then also have some uh, some female wrestlers on the list because we want this Hall of Fame to be all-inclusive. Um, so just to give that preset to the people listening out there, this is the list that I came up with with 10 people that I think are worthy of our <laughs> Observing Wrestling Hall of Fame. Uh, number 10, I have Trish Stratus. Number 9, I have Eddie Guerrero. Actually, it doesn't matter about the numbers. I'm not going to do the numbers. I have Trish Stratus, Eddie Guerrero, Bull Nakano, Shawn Michaels, Mr. HBK himself, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, The Great Muda, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, and Terry Funk. And I have, and I'll just make the announcement once again, he showed me his list first, so if you're wondering why Shawn Michaels is not on my list, since I always claim him to being my favorite, it was on his list, so it didn't make sense for me to pick that. But I tried to get a couple newer per- people in with some of my favorite legends as well, so I picked Macho Man, or it doesn't matter, like you said, there's not 10 to 1 or anything like that, it's just 10 people. Macho Man Randy Savage, Kazuchika Okada, AJ Styles, Roddy Roddy Piper, Charlotte Flair, Sting, The Undertaker, Rey Mysterio, and John Cena. And that last one was really hard to pick, but I was like, I think John deserves it. Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, this is a it's a damn good list, man, of 20 wrestlers, and we got to get rid of 15 <laughs> of them. <laughs> oh, God. So, all right, um, I'm going to let you go first. You may make a suggestion. If I'm very passionate about not wanting to get rid of them right away until we figure out things, we'll go from there. Um, but who do you have? I mean, the one on my list that I I think that I love probably more than a lot of other fans out there is Terry Funk. Um, and he he's one that I would put number one if it was just a me Hall of Fame. He would be my number one with a bullet because he is my all-time favorite wrestler. He is, like, to me, he is my Shawn Michaels, like how you are about Shawn Michaels. Terry is one of my favorites. Great guy in person. Absolute phenomenal wrestler who wrestled for fucking decades on decades. But if I'm being realistic, the, the one person I can't remove from this list is Ric Flair. I feel like that he has to be in there. I feel like any Hall of Fame without Ric Flair in there is just bullshit. So uh, right off the bat, the one I have with, like, number one with a bullet that has to go in off my list is Ric Flair. All right. So, and I kind of like the way that you, you sent it to me. You gave me one guy that we can eliminate. That you suggested, God, I mean, I don't know if I want to, I mean, God, if you go through 15, though, uh, but the Ric Flair, I'll give you that. I think that we can just go ahead and say Ric Flair made the top five. He's untouchable. I, I don't think that there is a reason not to have him. As far as the modern era, or just like 80s through now, I think he's one of the most important pieces uh, to influence uh, with wrestling, with, you know, style, uh him on the mic, you know, everything. So, yeah, I, I think that we can definitely do that. Now, as far as eliminating, are you sure you want to suggest Terry Funk? I'm just thinking I, out of out of the people named, he's going to be hard. I mean, because to me, if we're trying to get one female wrestler in and maybe one Japanese wrestler in, um, I'm going to have to sacrifice someone that I think should be, be in there just because my list is full of bangers to some extent so i you know i i'm not saying we should just cross off terry funk immediately i'm just being realistic about some of the other people i have on my list that may have made more of a global impact um or a landscape impact as opposed to terry funk which i mean terry funk during his time obviously huge to me one of the best in-ring performers ever to some extent i think Influencing people like Mick Foley, Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know, and now more so like a John Moxley and, and many other fucking wrestlers. Yeah, so that's where it's going to get really hard for us because, like, I, I mean, looking at your list, there's a lot of people that I really love, like Rey Mysterio Jr. I think he should be in eventually uh, without question. But it's, uh, like I said, there's some really good fucking wrestlers on this list, so it's going to be tough uh, going through it. So I will say, you know, out of some of the bigger names I have on my list, Terry would be the one that I think might end up getting pushed out, just depending on your opinion. 
Um, but if you want to name someone, let's let's go let's go from there. Someone that you think on your list should be in over someone that's on my list, or if there's someone that you think probably doesn't stack up with some of these names we have, um, let's let's go I'm, there. I'm gonna make a bold thing and say that I don't think there's a lot of modern wrestlers. Actually, I'm going to do exactly what you did. I'm going to give you a wrestler that I think could go, and I'm going to give you a wrestler I think should get in no matter what. You might think I'm crazy for this. Even above everyone, as far as modern wrestlers, I think there's one guy that me and you can say stacks up with some of these legends, and I think would be very important, especially when we're looking for a Japanese wrestler. I'm not saying let's take Great Muda out of it, and Bull Nakano is obviously a hybrid of both concepts we're going for. But I'd like to present that we keep Kazuchika Okada and maybe put him down or at least consider him for the top five unless we have to remove him. So wow. as of right now, he would be one of those five people. But, you know, unlike we can keep Flair there no matter what. But if we figure out we're in a rock and hard place, we can evaluate it then while taking people off. I'm going to suggest that we take off AJ Styles. I know he'll eventually make it. You know, I love AJ. But I don't know if he's necessary to be put in there. Yes, even though he's had more of a career than Kazushi Okada. That's how – I just feel like he's so important, man. He's just one of the best uh, out of this generation and one of the best of all time. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely one wrestler that you look at who is working at such a high level still. Um, and you just go – I mean, like, just look how many fucking great matches he's had in the past two years. He's – he, I so hard want to put him in this top five, but everyone knows that I'm a huge Okada fanboy to begin with. Um, and also, he's still current, man. I still expect him to have five more years of a career, at least. There's so much more he can do, but he's definitely deserving of it. Just based on his body of work thus far, he's deserving to be here. Um, I say we keep him for now, and we'll continue to go through this, because, like I said, we, I mean, we have some absolute fucking legends on this list. One, one, uh, one that's on your list, Macho Man Randy Savage, for instance, and one that's on my list, which is Mr. Dusty Rhodes. Where do those two fall? Are they above? Mm. Do you put them above Okada? Uh, Alright, so I think we should also, I think that me and you, if if that's how you felt beforehand, unless, like I said, you want to evaluate it differently and suggest anyone else we can take, like I said, AJ Styles and Terry Funk both, just have them off the list. They're still there for the future, but just remove them so they're not a space to kind of, like, you know, figure this out more. And with Okada, I put him as our five, but unlike Flair, who's, like, he's golden, he's someone that we can move around just based on eliminating some of these other choices. What do you think? Um you put Okada at number five and he's someone that we can move around or, or what? I, I think I missed what you were going for there as far as someone we can move around. Did you say flair? Or did you say, uh, well, I, all right. So out of the 20, we need to eliminate people. I think yeah. unless you, like I said, unless you want to change Terry, we can remove Terry and AJ right now. They're obviously still there for future thing. They'll eventually make it. And then when it comes to the five that we're building, Rick flair's golden. We want him in no matter what. That's that's a good choice. Okada's on that list, but he can be removed once we, if we deliberate later, once we get more choices off the list, then they can end up on this top five. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Yeah, I do. Um, I guess. Should we remove Terry and AJ? Yeah, I, I, I pulled them off, so they're pulled okay. off right now. They will still be in the future pool of wrestlers. Yep. Um, I mean, the one guy on my list, I, I love Dusty Rhodes. I love Terry Funk. Obviously, love Shawn Michaels, but I don't think that anyone has ever been as big of a draw just from a wrestling standpoint as the man I'm about to name, which is Stone Cold Steve Austin. And to me, he's he deserves to be on this list. He, I mean, it's Austin fucking 316. He's still a huge draw. He's one of the greatest performers, both if you go back to WCW with his in-ring work and then after his in- injury what he was able to accomplish is just his run against Vince McMahon. And obviously you can say, you know, he had Vince. Vince is one of the greatest heels of all time. But to me, as a draw, as a performer, as still who he is, Stone Cold Steve Austin to me deserves to be here. Maybe even more so than um, The Rock and, and 
to some extent Dusty Rhodes, who I have on this list as as a, one of my legends. Uh, all right, so you pick Stone Cold as a suggestion that we should definitely keep. Out of my list and your list, take a wrestler and kind of that you think that we can get rid of, basically. Not that you want them to, but that we can go without. I'll um I'll, I'll pull off Eddie Guerrero from my list because Ugh. I know he's going to make it in in the future, and he is one of my favorite wrestlers. I mean, I fucking love watching Eddie Guerrero matches. It's just his time at the top was very, very short, unfortunately, because of his passing. Um, so, but as far as his in-ring performance, I, I think he's he's kind of untouchable. I mean, he's up there with Crispin Waugh as one of the greatest in the ring ever. Um, so I, w- with great sadness, just based off who else is on my list, I think I'll, I'll, I will uh, succeed Eddie Guerrero off this list. And then maybe off your list, I, I think that John Cena will eventually get in, but maybe Cena. I'm not ready to pull someone like Piper or Mysterio off yet. All right. Um, trying to like, I'm sure you're trying to like add everything up. I completely agree with you with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Um, so once again, you know, and this could change. I think Ric Flair, me and you agree, he's going to stay there. Um, while we're getting rid of other people and realize who we have left. But for right now, we have Kazuchika Okada, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and Ric Flair as a part of the five that we're going to be putting into the Observing Wrestler Hall of Fame. God, I love that name. You know I just came up with that on the top of my ass right at the beginning of the show? (laughs) It's pretty good. Uh, Um, All right, so I'm I'm Ruben Cena. Uh, Hold on. We've gotten rid of, I think, I think our list. Okay. Yep. Uh, the next one that I want to suggest to you, Chris, uh, for getting rid of, at least we got to figure out the female wrestler too. We got some pretty good choices. Um, God damn it. <sighs> I hate saying this. <laughs> I hate saying this. I, I fucking love Ray Mysterio jr. I just feel kind of like what you said with Eddie and a lot of the other ones we've already talked about, AJ Styles included, that even though he, someone that revolutionized the industry, one of the greatest babyface of all time, he will have his time in the Hall of Fame. But I think that we can deal with getting rid of him right now. How do you feel about that? Well, it's going to hurt me as a short guy to pull Ray off the list, but <laughs> I guess, <laughs> uh, <sighs> yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. All right, so let's stick to tr- trying to remove people as, a, as opposed to trying to add people to the five so we can kind of get rid of some of these names. Who do you think, out of both of our lists, is someone that we can take out? And I maybe the thing is, the female wrestlers, we kind of need to address that. we got Charlotte, we got Bull Nakano, we got Trish Stratus. God damn, man. <laughs> let's figure this one out. Oh, God, I see the thing is I don't I don't know what to suggest. I mean all of them rightfully so deserve to be there. Um man, uh I'm gonna say I, you know what, maybe you'll agree with me. I think Bold Nakano should be the first one. She's got so much, you know, in a time period where she she just basically is so innovative towards modern female wrestling, I would say. Yeah, and I, I would, you know, as far as their matches go, I think that, you know, out, Charlotte's obviously had some really great matches, but Bull Nakano, when she was in uh, AJW, All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling, some of the matches that she had there were absolutely phenomenal. And then taking that in against people like Luna Bashan when she came over to North America as an early female wrestler, like her feuds with Alundra Blaze, I feel like that she's a trailblazer for a lot of female wrestlers. And exactly. If if you really look at it, she is kind of one of the only monster heel uh, female wrestlers that's ever really made it, maybe outside of, like, Awesome Kong, um, as far or as Aja. that style. Or, um, or Aja Kong, also, who's someone that we could have, could have easily probably made this list as well. I mean, Charlotte and Trish will definitely end up there. I'm kind of in agreement with you as far as putting in a female wrestler. Bull Nakano is one of my favorite of all times. There's something just so terrifying about her. When I was a child, she legitimately scared the shit out of me as a heel um, and, and had a phenomenal career. Um, 
God. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm with you on this one. I think right. that Bull Nakano is probably the female that makes the list. All right, so technically, <laughs> all right, and so the people we have left, we have on my list, Macho Man Randy Savage, Roddy Roddy Piper, Sting, The Undertaker, from your list, Dusty Rhodes, The Great Muda, The Rock, and HBK. I'm going to say that we technically have one space left for the Hall of Fame out of all those guys, and we should try to keep on figuring out who doesn't, you know, who we can take out. But remember, the second choice, Kazuchi Okada, my choice, we can still deliberate that choice and change it if we need to. Just realize, I think me and you, or not realize, at least for our listeners, realize, uh, I think me and you want to keep Ric Flair, Bull Nakano, and Stone Cold no matter what. Is that correct? Yeah, because we, like I said, the 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 idea was that we were going to put in at least one female wrestler. So I, I well deserved for Bull Nakano. So she's got to stick to the list. And and Ric Flair and Stone Cold Steve Austin, I think, are just kind of untouchable. They should probably be the first inducted. Um, on most most of these type of deals. So yeah, so I'm fine. Chris. Where we're sitting. So Chris, uh, remove one of these legends, and let's see if I agree with you. This is going to be interesting. Uh, yeah. You're probably going to hate me for this, but if I had to pick someone that was remaining on, on your list... Um, I know it's going to be. It's probably going to be Roddy Piper. Whoa! Uh, I thought you were going to say Sting. Oh my god, that just cut me in the chest. <laughs> and I will succeed if we take Piper off the list. We should probably pull Muda off the list. Okay, I think those are good, two good choices. I can agree with that. I love Roddy Roddy Piper, but I will. It's, I feel like you're giving that up more so than I am, and that's very, very nice of you. Uh, kind of like <laughs> concept. I love Piper, but I know how much you love him too. Uh, but he'll be on there eventually, and Great Muda, one of the most innovative wrestlers, period, bar none, one of the best mystique wrestlers. Just like Piper's one of the greatest brawlers of all time, one of the greatest heels, one of the greatest mic guys, they will eventually get in our Observing Wrestlers Hall of Fame. All right. <laughs> um, oh, God. All right. So now we got The Rock, Shawn Michaels, Dusty Rhodes, Undertaker, Sting, Macho Man. I know that Terry's your neck and neck, kind of like how I am. My two favorites remain. I know that your second favorite remains because you were nice enough to take out Mr. Funk. Um, but then again, then there's Macho Man Randy Savage, too, who's one of both of our favorites. Oh, God. All right. Well, I'm going to suggest off your list, and you kind of said this earlier, the great one himself. I love The Rock. I think he's amazing. You know, one of the best talkers and one of the best people, you know, stars to come out of WWE. But I think that he can wait to get in our Hall of Fame. All right. Well, if we're pulling the rock off, I think we pull Sting off. Okay. I'm fine with that. I think that Sting is great, and he's my second favorite wrestler of all time, but, you know, I, I, it makes sense. I believe that you're right on that. Oh, God. All right, so now it's your choice. You got four people, man. Uh, who do you think needs to go between Taker, Savage, Dusty, and HBK? Oh, man. Remember, we can remove Okada if we want to. All right. I'm going to go the opposite. Instead of removing someone, I'm just going to make a suggestion of someone that I think deserves to be on the list, and he's up there as our favorite wrestler of all time for both of us, especially growing up watching WWF during the 90s to some extent. And as bad as it's going to hurt me, I think I'm okay with pushing Dusty down the road. A little bit down the road. I'm not if you, down if the roads, if you will, baby. Um, but I'm not okay with pulling HBK off this list, just because. I mean, just right offhand, when I think about my favorite wrestlers and some of the best matches, and there's a guy on your list that he had a lot of fucking good matches with it. Would I would also sucks to have, maybe have to pull off. Yes. Um. But yeah, I feel like HBK deserves to be in this Hall of Fame. So I don't know what that does for Okada, and I don't know if you agree with me on this, but I feel like HBK should should be there. 
I'm not going to disagree on this one. <laughs> I can't. I want to be. I want to be humble, but I love Sean so much, and to me, he's the greatest in ring technician or not technician, whatever you want to fucking have it, in ring wrestler of all time. Um, but yeah, now let's. Now that we, I think we've we've got Ric Flair, Stone Cold, Bull Nakano, HBK. Does Okada deserve to be there over Savage, Taker, or Dusty? That's the question. I don't know. There's one person in general. I love Dusty. I love Taker. But I'm really torn between Macho Man Randy Savage and Kazuchika Okada. I don't know about you. If you have something different, definitely let me know. I mean, Okada is probably is is by far my favorite current professional wrestler. I am too. Um, and in a lot of ways, because his career is still going, and I know it's only going to get better, like he's going to continue to have great matches, I'm okay with, with pulling him off the list, even though I think he had one of the best matches I've ever seen in my life that first fucking Okada Omega match is still just one of my absolute favorites. Everything about that match was perfect. Um, but then again, before that, <laughs> and as a kid, the match that I thought was perfect, the perfect match was Macho Man, Randy Savage versus Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Um, Dusty, I'm okay. I think Dusty was a great promo, and I think he did a lot specifically for some of these upcoming stars in NXT, and obviously a lot for the business in general as both a booker, a performer. Um, and but there's a coach. also in a coach. And, and there's negative things you could say about some of Dusty's in ring work um, to some extent. Whereas, like, Macho Man, you don't ever hear anyone say anything bad about Macho Man, really. Um, Dane, I don't know, man. Who do you who who would you pull off? I'm gonna pass it back uh, to you. On this one. All right, I'm gonna mention the Undertaker and say that I love him, just like Dusty, and I agree with everything that you said. Great coach, great mind for the wrestling business. You know, Booker, Russell, or even say storyteller. Uh, and Undertaker, one of the greatest, if not greatest, wrestler with mystique. Um, one of the greatest big guys when it comes to abilities of uh, you know just doing stuff that big guys should not do. One of the first guys to really do that and take it up. A notch. And honestly, someone that's last every iteration of WWE throughout all their generations. I mean, he was a part of the tail end of the the uh, the rock and wrestling generation. He was a part, obviously, really involved in the next generation attitude era and keep on going. He's always been around and he still hasn't stopped technically. I think Macho Man should replace Kazuch- Kazuchika Okada. I love Okada. He is the youngest and newest wrestler out of this, you know, 15 now that we have. Um, and he'll get there eventually. He'll probably be a part of the list next time of the top five. I'll suggest him. So let's do Ric Flair, Macho Man Randy Savage, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Bull Nakano, and HBK Shawn Michaels. I think that's the list. That's the first five official inductees into the Observing Wrestlers Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> so to All right, recap, well. <laughs> to recap, we have Ric Flair, Stone Cold Steve Austin, HBK, the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels, Bull Nakano, and the Macho Man, Randy Savage, which I think is a damn good place to start. All right, now the fun thing. Let's figure out five wrestlers that we think can join the fifteen to make it a solid twenty of wrestlers that we want to be a part of this eventual hall of fame chris i'm gonna let you pick the first choice and if i oppose it i'll save my reasoning and we'll go from there but we've been uh working with each other which i thought exactly would happen so uh who's someone that you'd like to add to this list along with the 15 that we removed damn this is gonna be tough tough one for me um i'm gonna i'm gonna say we add bruiser brody to this list oh all right. You know what? I'm down. I like that. I, I like that a lot, actually. Bruiser Brody. I'm going to suggest someone that I think me and you might have both forgot. Um, Le Champion, Mr. Chris Jericho. Yep. Um, 
I think that's a great suggestion. I'm completely fine with him being there. If I uh, make a follow-up suggestion, and I think probably the glaring mission from this Hall of Fame, uh, Brett the Hitman Hart. All right. Brett Hart. Great choice. And we got um, two more choices. So the fourth. I am going to suggest... Uh, do I, want a, do I want a women's wrestler? What do I want exactly? This is, like you said, this is fucking, it's hard. Oh, Lord. Um, see, I'm going newer. I don't mean to. I, I don't want to. You know what? No, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my foot down on this. I think that Hulk Hogan should be up for consideration. We're going to go okay. by his wrestling and not his out of everything else that comes with Hulk Hogan. Let's just put it that way. But what he I guess, did... Yeah, I mean, uh, he, he deserves to be at least in conversation, for sure. Like, without a doubt, for as big as a name as he was and as huge of a draw as he was. Um, I'm going to throw one out there. Actually, going into the WWE Hall of Fame this year, Jushin Liger. All right, I think that we have five wrestlers to add back to the 15 that we took away, and those are our 20, the pot, if you will, that we will pull and try to figure and deliberate who should be, you know, in our Hall of Fame for our next five choices to join the Nature Boy Ric Flair, Macho Man Randy Savage, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Bull Nakano, and the heartbreak kid himself, Shawn Michaels. I think we did Boom, good work here. <laughs> uh, and obviously, this is for fun. These are this is you know, we're not generating this off the base cells. It's objective, but uh, there's no one on this list that you could say is not a Hall of Famer. I'll say that. <laughs> so I think we uh, we started off with a bang here, and. Um, Unless you got anything else, man, I think we can probably wrap up the show. I have an idea, but I don't know how you feel about this. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it, we'll do it live. <laughs> let's uh, let's pick a wrestler, just one. You know, I'll have a suggestion if you want. You'll have a suggestion. Um, or actually, no, maybe it would make sense, so we don't have to debate or anything like that. Two wrestlers to put in our Observing Wrestlers Hall of Shame. Now there has doesn't you could be fucking Bastion Booger you could be well, whoever that you just don't think will be ever on the Hall of Fame or want on the Hall of Fame. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you can go first on this one. Um. So now now that I said that now I'm kind of setting myself off because I don't know who to pick. Uh, Disco Inferno. <laughs> I'm okay with you putting Disco on here I know you and him already have some heat <laughs> Either me or his Fucking uh, intern bitch That fucking loves him so much <laughs> Oh man I don't know that I would necessarily Say that he's like the worst atrocity That I would put on no. this list first. Um, Man Let's see I'm gonna say uh, Whew I guess, man, this is tough because I'm just trying to think about, like, Lodi from Raven's Flock. I remember <laughs> him being specifically awful as a kid, so I'm going to say we put Lodi on this list. Oh, we're just destroying the, uh, the, the Nitro. And yes, I do actually know that in-ring-wise, Disco's good. And he was a big writer in WCW. Just realized it was during a time period that was tumultuous. Uh, so there you go. This is our specific list. We got Lodi from the Flock and Disco Inferno in our Observing Wrestler Hall of Shame. Um, yeah, I like this. I think this is. A, I think it's a lot of fun, Chris. We'll have to keep up with this. Um, guys, Thursday. It's just based on how much stuff actually happens. Obviously, stuff is slowed down. We might end up doing something like this. Uh, not, not. We're, we're going to live the Hall of Fame uh, for a minute, you know. But we will probably do something else. Maybe a watch along if we have nothing to talk about Sunday. Who knows? 
we'll watch an old match together, try to match everything up, and then talk about it and give commentary. Who knows? But uh, either way, thank you so much for listening to our show. Chris, any closing statements? And um, say goodbye to all the wonderful people out there. Yeah, everyone, just be safe. Have a good weekend. Um, be kind to one another, as I always say. Uh, and then also, uh, if you like hockey, tomorrow there'll be a new At Skates to Throats podcast. You can hit me up on Twitter at, at Chris R. Patton um, and on Facebook at, at Christopher.R.Patton. Thanks for listening, guys. And you guys can find me at, I think it's Danales42 on Twitter and on Facebook at Danales. Uh, just look me up. Let me know how you liked our list, what you didn't like about it, whatever. You know, just just let's have a conversation. Join Geek Fives Nation. And to do that, go to www.geekfivesnation.com. You'll find news there uh, from our amazing writers like Tia over stuff related to, you know, comics, comic book movies, movies, video games, wrestling. We do a bunch of different articles. Definitely check that out. You can also find our social media uh, for Geek Vibes Nation. Uh, links there for our Instagram, our Twitter, and our Facebook. Join the groups. Join everyone in talking. We love uh, communicating with you guys. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and you guys can listen to us. Uh, we're on all audio platforms, uh, you know, like Stitcher, uh, like Spotify, um, you know, iTunes, anything like that. You can find us, SoundCloud, listen to us, download us, and let us know what you think. Rate us on all of these things. We'd really appreciate it. We're usually on YouTube as well. So check that out, whatever works for you. We love you guys. Thank you so much. You guys have a good weekend. Be safe. Be clean. Wash your hands. Wash your ass. And have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much, and let the Geek Buys be with you.